<clears throat> All right, everybody, welcome to uh, this Sunday's Dialogue. Uh, I am your brother, Asad. Thank you guys for joining us. Adrian, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Definitely. So <laughs> Adrian is here and we are super duper excited to have this dialogue uh, today. Now, as you know, we originally started this kind of series where it was kind of just open dialogue between, <clears throat> between our South African family and African-American family. We were discussing kind of similarities and, and you know, the developments of different things in, 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 uh, in each country or whatever have you. And uh, then we decided to kind of um, move to a more, uh, let me see, admit here. We decided to move to a different format where we have discussions between, I guess, professionals uh, from each side. So last month in January, we had a discussion on mental health. And there's UC right there. Last month, uh, we had a discussion on um, mental health between uh, two clinical um, psychologists, Dr. Brian Turner and on Pile, uh, Sister on Pile. And that was a great discussion. But this, this month, February, we are having a discussion on a very, very important topic. I see my brother UC has made it here. Uh, a very important topic, criminal justice, right? Uh, um, it is one of the most, um, I guess, particularly here in the United States, one of the most important topics because so many African-American individuals actually have uh, interaction with the criminal justice system. You know, we are one of the, the most over-policed populations in this, uh, in this country, over-policed and meaning not only are we arrested at higher rates, but we also end up in the criminal justice system at alarming, alarmingly, alarmingly high rates. So um, without further ado, I see we have both our esteemed guests here. We will go ahead and get started with this criminal justice dialogue. So um, yeah, I will, I will allow each, uh, take this moment for each of our esteemed guests. Brother, brother UC, uh, are you here? I want to make sure you, I can hear you. I'm on, I'm on, Doc. All right, cool, cool. Brother UC, brother UC oh, there you go, the boy clean too. <laughs> the boy clean. So brother UC, I'm, I'm going to allow you to go first. Just a brief introduction. Tell us about yourself. Um, type of law you practice, where you practice, law school. Well, your honor is is big, big, big my stuff. Lord. To, my lord, yeah, oh, my excuse, lord. Excuse me. Excuse well, I me. think it's good. I'm going yeah. to have to mute. I'm going to have to mute somebody. All right, make sure you guys mute yourself when you come on, okay? Brother Yusi, go ahead. All right, well, thanks, Doc. Uh, well, as, as uh, Doc said, my name is Yusi Phillips. Um, I practice, uh, well, one of my areas of practice uh, here in New Orleans is uh, criminal law. Uh, I've been practicing law since uh, 2005, so I'm about 17 years in now. Uh, when I started, initially I was uh, I worked as a prosecutor in the district attorney's office here in uh, New Orleans. Uh, I served as a uh, not only a, uh, a line prosecutor, but uh, during my tenure with the district attorney's office, which lasted about six years, ultimately I became um, the deputy chief of trials for that office and supervised uh, sometimes up to six sections of court, uh, handled uh, major criminal offenses like armed robberies, rapes, murders, of course, uh, and things of that nature. And I also trained uh, district attorneys uh, to do their job. Uh, after about six years or so of doing that, uh, I left the DA's office and uh, went into private practice initially with uh, a couple of uh, my former DA uh, friends. Uh, we started a firm. Uh, I worked with them for about a year and some change. Uh, then I decided to go out on my own and develop my own practice, um, which I, I run to this day and I've been doing for the past maybe 10, 11 years now. Um, and for the most part, my practice consists of uh, primarily criminal defense, uh, but I also do some uh, other things uh, like personal injury. Um, and I also still maintain uh, some work as a prosecutor. I do some work with the city and municipal and traffic court as a prosecutor for the city. Uh, and, and that primarily handles like uh, municipal offenses and uh, traffic offenses, uh, but it also allows me to keep my private practice and, and continue my criminal defense. Uh, but that's in a nutshell, pretty much uh, my practice and, and what I've been and what I what I do. Man, y'all, yeah, he's 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 really downplaying it, man. This brother was 
a, like the prosecutor. He was doing major things, always in the news for putting the bad guys away. My my lord, uh, uh, Brian, uh, my lord, Mashiel, will you uh, take a moment and introduce yourself? I think you're on mute. Yes, I was muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, my name is uh, Brian Mashile. I'm a judge in the High Court of South Africa. Um, I've been, prior to becoming a judge, which is about eight years ago, I was a, um, I completed university in 1988 and um, served what we call articles of clerkship from 89 to 90. Um, I suppose that would be, I don't know whether you have it, but in some kind of an internship at the end of which you write a board exam for acceptance into practice. And in 1991, I started my own firm, which was a general practice. But um, initially we, well, um, uh, my partner and I did um, largely um, criminal work and later um, diversified our practice into commercial, uh, corporate, and so, so we grew and had different um, departments. So commercial, corporate, commercial, and so on. And about 21 years later, I was then um, invited to joined the bench, which was in 2013 when I joined the bench. So currently I am um, a judge of the High Court of South Africa. Um, I don't, we don't, as judges, we don't specialize. We um, do everything from criminal to commercial, whatever you put on the table, we gobble. Um, that's the the long and short of my background. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. I, I want to jump in and ask you guys a few questions. So, um, my lord, what what led you to practice law? And then we'll we'll get UC's version. Well, what what made you decide law to decide law as a profession? Well, well, I guess it was at the time when I. Um, came onto the scene, um, it was, um, or the, 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 the field was seen as one that would um, contribute towards the liberation of our people. Um, there were very uh, few people who um, were lawyers at the time. I mean, in my township, in your sense, in my hood, a uh, township is an equivalent of a hood in America. Yeah. So um, quite a lot of people were convicted because they were not um, represented. So um, it was every black man's inspiration um, or having seen uh, people like Nelson Mandel and, and other people uh, or leaders um, leading the struggle with qualification behind them as law. Um, every young man's wish was to become a lawyer and I was no exception. So essentially I was inspired by um, such people to go into um, the area. You, you know that, that that's very interesting because there was a time where a lot of African-American men wanted to become ministers. My dad is a part of that generation because it was people like Adam Clayton Powell, who was a reverend, and obviously Dr. Martin Luther King was a reverend. So they saw becoming a minister as one of the ways that they could be freedom fighters. Uh, Brother Yusi, what, what what led you to practice law? Uh, well, actually, um, you know, my my role to the legal profession was uh, a little unorthodox, so to speak. Um, when I started out, I was initially a musician, um, a jazz musician. Uh, that was my passion. That was something that I thought I was going to end up doing for the rest of my life. And um, in about my maybe sophomore, junior year of college, um, I started to realize that uh, I started to see the people around me 
who are old enough to be my father, my grandfather, doing the same thing I was doing at 18, 19 years old. And I kind of thought to myself, I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to do this when I'm 50, you know, doing the same thing I'm doing. I've had a lot of fun doing it, but I, I knew there was more uh, out there for me uh, than just playing gigs and going on tours and things of that nature. Uh, so, and by my junior year in college, I actually uh, started looking into law uh, and I didn't actually apply or do the things to get in until my senior year, which was extremely late. If you talk to people who go to law school here in the States, it's something they prepare for sometimes uh, in uh, coming out of high school almost, mm. uh, you know, and, and I definitely didn't take that route. And uh, when I made that move, uh, people told me I couldn't do it. Why am I doing it? Doesn't make sense. Uh, but I knew I had an, I just had an interest in the law. You know, at the time I would write music and I would always wonder like, how does the copyright law work? And how can, if somebody plays this, how do I, how does that work? So that's kind of what got my foot in the door uh, with law. And uh, I got into Loyola University here in New Orleans. And, um, and my passion is actually trying cases. I'm a trial lawyer. Uh, that's the first thing I tell people. I'm not a, I'm not a transactional lawyer. I'm not a lawyer that's going to sit behind the desk and push paper all day and bill hours. I'm the guy that's going to be in the courtroom. And um, that's what led me to the district attorney's office because that opportunity provided me uh, the, the ability to be in court every day, uh, to hone my trial skills and to just develop as a lawyer. And I just, I just went from there, you know, but, but one of the things that kind of put me in that, in that, in that mindset of being a trial lawyer was actually my grandmother. Uh, when I was a kid, my grandmother used to babysit me and my brother a lot, and, and her favorite show to watch was Perry Mason. And <laughs> <laughs> what I always remembered about Perry Mason, man, is he never lost a case until the last episode. And then he, we, you know, that's arguable. Maybe he didn't lose that one. But uh, yeah. but when I saw that, that kind of piqued my interest because I wanted to do what I saw the lawyers on TV do. I wanted to go to court. I wanted to uh, argue my case. I wanted to um, advocate for my positions. And uh, it just happened to lead me into uh, into the criminal justice system, which is where I, I pretty much strived at and built my career. Okay. So that's kind of how I made my way into the legal profession. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stick with you for a moment. You, what is the uh, process of becoming a lawyer in the United States? And is there a different process in Louisiana versus the rest of the country? Actually, and, and really, uh, there is. Uh, to become a lawyer in the United States, the first thing you have to do is to uh, graduate from an accredited law school. Um, and well, if you back up to get into law school, you have to, you actually have to take a test to get in. Uh, it's called the LSAT and it, it kind of grades you on your problem solving skills uh, yeah, and things of that nature, your rationale, logic. Uh, the test is pretty much like a big logic game, to be honest with you. And depending on your score on that test, that determines um, how viable you will be as a, as a candidate to get in law school when you apply. So once you cross that hurdle and get into law school, uh, then uh, that, uh, you know, that process is, 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 is an animal in and of itself. I mean, just surviving those three years, uh, doing what you need to do to kind of keep your grades up to, to be successful and get a job when you get out. Uh, and then once you graduate law school and it, it takes three years, uh, could take up to four, um, then you take the bar, the bar exam. Now in Louisiana, it's very different than in other parts of the country because um, you can graduate from a law school, say in Texas and practice in New York, maybe uh, California, different places around the country. But if you graduate from a law school in Louisiana, in order to practice in Louisiana, uh, you have to pass the Louisiana bar. And uh, the law down here is a little bit different. Louisiana law is based on the Napoleonic Code. So uh, if you study or you come from an accredited law school in Louisiana, your studies are going to be uh, highly intensive uh, in that area. And, and the bar exam is going to focus pretty much on that area. Uh, and in order to uh, end up uh, getting your, to get your license, uh, you would have to pass the bar and uh, be very fluent in the Napoleonic Code as it relates to the law in Louisiana, uh, as it differs from other parts of the country. So to answer your question, you kind of, Louisiana is kind of its own little little uh little deal as far as law is concerned because uh there are things that are very specific to the state that are, that don't really apply in other parts of the country yeah. and i and i want to add to that answer you have to go to undergrad first you have to do like four years oh, absolutely. absolutely of undergrad before you do the three years of law school absolutely. Uh, my, my lordship what is the process uh to become an attorney or lawyer in in, in south africa well you need a um 
four year degree, university degree. And um, previously or prior to that, you had to do a, a junior degree before you could um, do what was referred to as Bachelor of Laws. So it, it's a degree that you couldn't do without a junior degree, but these days that has changed. But during my time, you, uh, you had to have a junior degree, a three-year degree, plus a two or three-year degree, depending on how long it would take you to complete your Bachelor of Laws degree. Um, and um, thereafter, you would then serve articles with a, um, an established firm of attorneys. Uh, that could be a large firm or a small firm or a, a sole practitioner uh, or a sole um, partner firm. And um, yeah, once you, 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 you um, once you have, oh yeah, that period would take you two years then. Now, they have established what they call law, is it law school, a practical uh, training, legal something, but it's called PLT, practical legal training, yes. Practical legal training, uh, which is for a year. If you do that, uh, so it's for about 60, I mean, um, it's for about six months at the end of which you write your board exam, even before you can start your internship or let's call it articles here. Yeah? And um, once you've done that, you can then, um, if you pass, you still have to wait for your, the whole period, uh, which is two years. You can then be admitted into a practice as an attorney. Attorney in South Africa, unlike in the US, it's, uh, it's uh, it has a specific a specific meaning. It doesn't mean um, uh, we use it. Um, the equivalent of an attorney here is uh, a solicitor in um, the UK. A barrister. The equivalent of a barrister here is an advocate. So, an attorney is open to the public. An advocate um, is only open to attorneys. Just like in the UK, a solicitor briefs a, a barrister um, if a matter is, uh, go, goes to the high court. So that's how it recently they've introduced law and the advocates are now divided into two. You still have attorneys and advocates, but the uh, advocate's profession is divided into two. There are those who operate um, somewhat like um, attorneys in the sense that they are able to consult or to have the public as their clients. They can take, uh, they have what they call a trust account. Um, which means they can receive money from the public. Whereas the other form of uh, or type of advocates cannot open um, trust accounts. They still, or shall I say, that's just the old form of um, advocates. They have attorneys as their client. They don't take instructions directly from the public. Um, yeah. Um, that's pretty much the, 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 the idea. So you have the sidebar, which is the attorney's practice, and the bar, which is the advocate's practice. Okay. And the advocate's practice, as I said, is divided into two. Those who operate pretty much like the attorneys, they have access to the public, uh, subject to them doing accounting and having a trust account. And the other type of advocates who do not have access to the public and they don't have to have an accounting uh, accounting as a, as a subject 
um, yeah, deadlines um, are attorneys. Okay. Let, yes. let, let me ask. Let me ask you this. Um, and uh, brother, you see, you could you could take this one, and then we'll we'll come back to uh, my lord. Um, yeah. Please, please explain to me the process from arrest to uh, complete adjudication uh, in in the United States. Okay. So uh, the way the way it works in the United States, when when someone is is arrested, uh, which is basically an accusation that the, a law enforcement agency has made, whether it's a police department, uh, the federal government, or or even if it's some administrative um, uh, situation. But once an allegation is made and that person is arrested, uh, then of course they, they're brought to jail, they're booked on whatever they're charged with. And at that point, the district attorney is gonna have a certain amount of time to make a decision on whether or not he's gonna prosecute or not prosecute uh, that particular person for that particular offense. Now, the district attorney is of course the chief prosecutor uh, for uh, different, in, in Louisiana, we have parishes, uh, in other parts of the country, they call them counties, but that person will be the chief prosecutor for their particular geographical area. And once that person is arrested, depending on if it's a felony or a misdemeanor, the district attorney is going to have a certain amount of time to either accept that charge for prosecution or refuse that charge. So if it's a misdemeanor offense, which means it's offense, an offense that carries up to six months in prison, maybe a fine the district attorney is gonna have 45 days to make a decision on whether or not to accept or refuse that charge if that person remains in jail. If that person bonds out, the district attorney is gonna have 90 days, okay? But, uh, but that person is gonna have to have a bond set within 72 hours. Most of the times it's 48 hours. Uh, pretty much here in, in, in Louisiana, we pretty much get it done in less than 24 hours for the most part. But, um, that's for misdemeanors. If the person is arrested for a felony, the district attorney is going to have a little more time. He's going to have 60 days if that person cannot make a bond. He's going to have 120 days if that person can make a bond. If the felony, if the crime is something that's punishable by, by death or life imprisonment, the district attorney is going to have 120 days period to make his decision. So that's kind of the, the initial phase of when someone gets arrested. Uh, I, I like to call it the screening phase. Uh, and at that point, the district attorney is evaluating the evidence he has, uh, evaluating the witnesses he may have, and determining the viability of the case that's been brought to him by that law enforcement agency. Now, the district attorney also has the authority to, to maybe charge another crime or a different crime than that person was arrested for. It. For example, the person may be arrested for uh, possessing an amount of cocaine, let's say, and uh, the police may charge him with simple possession of cocaine, which is a felony, but it's a lower felony. The district attorney may review that evidence and decide we're not going to charge him with some possession. We're going to charge him with possession with intent to distribute the cocaine because maybe they review something that shows the person may have been in the act of distributing it, or, or maybe there's some other evidence they have that they can link him up to a, a ring that distributes cocaine or something like that. So the district attorney ultimately makes that decision. Once the, the district attorney decides uh, what he's going to prosecute, he files what's called a bill of information against that person. So that's the district attorney's formal accusation uh, against this person for the crime he's alleging uh, that he's committed. Uh, that's one way that the district attorney institutes the prosecution. Another way prosecution can be instituted here in the States is called by indictment. Uh, and that's when the DA or the, or the federal government, they summon what's called a grand jury. And they present evidence to this grand jury. And the grand jury is just... Uh, 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 so it was supposed to be uh, our your peers or the peers of the individual charge, but um, the district attorney can make his decision on who he wants to present this evidence to, and uh, he convenes a grand jury. Sometimes it's ten people, sometimes it's twelve people, sometimes it's fourteen people, and typically they serve for about three or four months at a time, I believe. And what they do is, anytime the district attorney wants to indict someone and not just file a bill of information, they call these people in and they present their evidence to them. No other side, the defense attorneys can't talk. No one can present evidence other than that district attorney's office. Mm -hmm. And they can present what they want to present to these people. And the people have input. They can say, well, look, we think we want to see a little more evidence or we think we have enough. And then they make a decision. And if they return what's called a true bill indictment, then that person is then indicted on that offense. Now, the district attorney has the discretion to either file a bill of information 
which is something he can do on his own. You don't even have to be arrested. The district attorney can just file a bill of information and charge you with a crime with no evidence. I mean, that can happen, and it has happened before. Right. Or he can decide to file, a, a, to, to convene a grand jury and, and get an indictment. Now, there's some offenses that require an indictment. So if someone is charged with like murder or, or an aggravated rape, which is an, which is an offense that uh, carries a mandatory life sentence in, uh, in Louisiana, it's called first degree rape now. But those offenses, regardless of, 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 of the DA's view of the case, they have to be indicted by a grand jury. Once either that bill of information is, in file, is filed or the grand jury returns an indictment, then the case is what's called accepted, okay? It's, it's been accepted for prosecution, and then it moves forward in the courthouse, and we see what we typically see on TV or things like that, where a person goes to court, uh, they enter a plea of not guilty, of course, um, and then the case proceeds uh, through, through the system, well, through the courthouse, basically. And at that point, after that in arraignment, where the person enters that plea of either guilty or not guilty, uh, then it proceeds to procedural hearings and evidentiary hearings and constitutional hearings. And those things involve the judge deciding on whether or not the person's uh, constitutional rights were violated um, during their interaction with law enforcement. They decide what evidence the state or the prosecutor can or cannot use at trial. And, and a number of other things that the attorneys may bring to the judge's attention. After those procedural issues and constitutional issues are resolved, then the case proceeds to another phase, which is called the trial phase. And that's typically where the defendant decides if he wants to have a trial by jury or a trial by the judge alone. Uh, and that's largely a decision, uh, a strategy decision, uh, depends on the case. Uh, you know, on, on, on my side, you know, there, there are cases that I've decided that I thought would be better for a judge to hear uh, alone. The cases that I've decided that uh, I think it'd be better for a jury to hear to get the outcome that that I feel is appropriate for my client. And then, of course, once that phase happens um, and, and the case proceeds to trial, there's a verdict, whether the verdict is rendered by the judge or the verdict is rendered by the jury. If the verdict is an acquittal or not guilty, then the case is over. The process stops. Everybody goes home. Uh, if it is a guilty verdict of any sort, then uh what happens next is the sentencing phase of the case and at that point uh in in at least in louisiana a judge cannot sentence you if you're found guilty within i believe it's 48 hours uh because uh the the idea in the law is that you know at that once the judge hears the evidence whether it's a judge trial or a jury trial uh the idea is to kind of let the blood cool. That's kind of law describes it. Let the judge kind of relax, let it um, kind of kind of clear out for a minute before uh, sentencing the person. So the sentencing is not done out of emotion or or mm. some just uh, knee jerk reaction the judge may have to the facts of what they've heard during the case. Um, after the person is sentenced, uh, then the last phase is pretty much the post conviction phase. And that's when the person can raise issues that may have happened at the trial if they want to appeal. Uh, maybe the judge let some evidence in that wasn't supposed to, uh, that you know, they feel shouldn't have been let in. And, uh, and the post-conviction phase can last for anywhere from two years to 30 years because there's some uh, exceptions that allow someone to file a conviction for post-conviction, an application, I'm sorry, for post-conviction relief if things happen down the line that uh, weren't anticipated. The example is, Say like if someone is convicted at a trial of a, for a murder, and then 20 years later, someone comes forward and says, well, you know what? I testified in that trial and I lied. I really didn't see this or, or, some, or uh, something else comes up. Well, there's an exception that allows that defendant who's been convicted to now re-urge his appeal based on this newly discovered evidence. Uh, and, and, that, and it's just like one, that one exception, I think, kind of extends um, the amount of time someone can exercise an appeal. But for the most part, once you exhaust your appellate rights, once you leave the state court, and then you can also go to the federal court if you can't get relief there, once your appeals have been denied, technically it's over, your conviction is final. With the exception of that newly discovered evidence or something that falls into one of those exceptions that allows you to uh, re-urge your appeal in certain situations. But, it, but that's pretty much how the process goes from the point of arrest all the way through uh, conviction. It's so funny, man, because when you watch uh, TV, you watch uh, Law and Order, 
they arrest a person and then five minutes later he's in court. <laughs> he he's in court at trial. There's no there's, you don't hear about all these processes. And and what happens as as the public, as a member of the public, we hear about someone getting arrested and then you know we don't it kind of goes away out of the news media, whatever have you. And you don't realize that all of these steps in between finally and the next time we hear it, he's either convicted or he's not or, or something right. like that. But all these steps in between that can actually prolong a case. Case of someone can be arrested, it could take a year or two before they actually make it to trial or a resolution of the case is, 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 is found. Uh, my lordship, what, what is the process in, in South Africa from arrest to adjudication? Yeah, I, I won't be as uh, detailed as um, um, my counterpart. But um, I'll take you through the salient um, stages. Uh, but firstly, I, I don't think the, the process is very different from uh, the state with um, a few exceptions, of course. Um, yeah, the, the police would make an arrest. Um, they hand over to the um, prosecution. Um, here we have at the head, we have what they call National Prosecuting Authority, uh, which is a national body under which um, you have different uh, director of public prosecutions um, who are found in each province. Province is an equivalent of um, a state in the US. Now, um, once, um, um, that person is arrested. You, they, the, the the police or the DPP has about um, forty, not about uh, forty eight hours within which to bring that person before um, courts. Um, charged, if not charged, um, he must be um, released. Um, at least there must be um, some form of. Uh, um, charge when he appears before uh, before court within that 48 hours. Otherwise, he must go. If he doesn't appear within that 48 hours, uh, say he is brought to court after 48 hours, he must be released. Um, if he is, uh, if he comes before court within the uh, prescribed time. Um, he will then be required to plead or the matter will be postponed for further investigations. Um, uh, one can apply for bail and um, or the police can have seven days um, grace within which to investigate properly, uh, to investigate the matter properly um, whilst um, the accused remains um, in custody. After seven days, there must be some extraordinary reason to explain why this person should be, should not be granted bail or the accused must show what they call exceptional circumstances, why he should be um, released on bail. Otherwise, you'll, you'll, you'll um, continue to be kept in custody. Um, the matter will ultimately, um, if charged or once charged, he will then come to um, court, plead either guilty or not guilty. If he pleads guilty, um, the presiding officer will decide whether he accepts that um, um, plea um, or not. If it's a, a guilty plea, the, the, the presiding officer will say, um, I accept or I don't, um, in which case, if he doesn't, it means the matter, a, a, a plea of not guilt will be entered and the matter will proceed as, um, as a, a not guilty uh, matter. Um, if found guilty at the end, that's another, uh, uh, who, okay, he will be sentenced and um, the correctional uh, system takes over. Of course, if not found guilty, 
that's the end of the matter there. But if found guilty, there will be sentence and the correctional um, system takes over. Um, that's about it. I don't think I can go beyond that. The long and short of it. I have a Unless question. Have questions. Yes. As, 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 a, as a judge, I'm sure there's some cases. Um, ha have you ever experienced a case where you really struggle to make a decision on someone's guilt or not? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, that has never been uh, a problem for me. What um, is a problem in most cases is sentencing, which is more challenging, I think. Okay. But um, uh, whether you want to convict or not has never been, uh, I've never been, uh, or has never uh, been a challenge to me. And, and, and how much discretion do you have over sentencing? Well, well, well it's, look, um, you, each uh, offender or um, convicted person um, is different from the next. So uh, there's no uniformity. Um, you can sentence a person to life for murder and um, another or in similar circumstances, depending on who that person is, um, you can sentence that person 25 years or 30 years. So um, you can't say that that's how wide the discretion is, but um, yeah, it, there's no uniformity. And then um, you, you have to assess the individual before you um, uh, with his um, circumstances as they are presented to you. Brother Yusi, uh, kind of similar question. Have you ever taken on a case that um, maybe you kind of struggled with the uh, defendant or struggled with the maybe the facts of the case? And uh, can you address like the sentencing uh, discretion that judges appear? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, in my in my private practice, um, I have a little more discretion on things I can I take and I don't take. Uh, but as, as a prosecutor, you know, you pretty much take what comes to your section. But um, I absolutely uh, deal with that issue every day. Um, you know, one of the, the main areas that I, I choose not to deal with are, are uh, sex offenses involving children, particularly. Um, those things I just don't uh, feel uh, I, I could put my best foot forward on because uh, sometimes emotions may get in the way. Or, or things that are, are so heinous, uh, where you just can't put aside the fact, the facts to really just do your job, and and kind of what I what I kind of want to touch on, and I think kind of goes towards the sentencing piece that uh, 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 Lord just just spoke about is um, you know in the criminal justice system, I think what we have to do uh, as criminal justice professionals on any level is we have to get beyond that emotional uh, reaction to things. Um, we have to get past how something feels and how it looks and just apply our expertise to the situation at hand. Uh, a lot of times, especially now, we hear something in the media, we see something and within five minutes, the person has been tried, convicted, sentenced, and the facts aren't even out. Right. And, and I think that's due to this, this just push, like, I think everybody just wants to have an opinion and feel some kind of way immediately. Right. Mm -hmm. I have to, I have to stake my opinion. I have to draw the line. And a lot of times, especially in the criminal justice system, it doesn't play out like that. You may not know the facts until a year later. And, and you may find something out that can, will totally change your perspective from what you initially felt. But I think what we, you know, the, the issue, at least that I, I dealt with was, uh, being able to put aside how you how something looks and how it feels and just apply the law. And in that phase before trial and during trial, I mean, that's what you have to do. But in a sentencing piece, I think that's where judges have more leeway uh, to maybe exercise their view or their opinion on certain things. And that's why you have some judges 
I, I just throw out there, let's say on a drug case, they may sentence someone to probation, but you may go 10 minutes away to another courthouse and that same person on the same case may get 10 years. Mm. But that's because that judge's temperament is such that he's allowed the discretion at that point to express how he feels about what happened. But we as attorneys and other members of the criminal justice system, we can't really do that because if we get involved on that level and, and start acting uh, based on maybe how we feel about a certain thing or a certain crime or a certain offense, then I think it hinders our ability to put our best foot forward for our client or any side we represent in a situation. So, um, so that's uh, to kind of answer your question. I mean, yes, there are situations and cases that I, I, I don't deal with because not because I'm inept, but because I know that uh, based on my life experience, it's something that I would rather not uh, have to defend, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, and I think I would be doing uh, that person a disservice by taking their case, knowing that I have certain feelings about uh, those types of crimes. I'm going to pivot a little bit and, I, and and whoever wants to take this question can take it. We we know that um, uh, African-American giants like Thurgood Marshall. Just, just, be, just before you, you go on, I said, I just need to um, perhaps um, throw in a, um, a, a caution up on what I said when I said the um, sentencing discretion is quite wide. While it is wide, it should be exercised um, uh, judiciously and circumspectly. circumspectly. So you can't just say um, it's exercised within a particular set of rules. It is wide though, but um, you are not giving just a free range to do as you wish. So as long as you can justify um, why you went to the extent to which you um, you did. Okay, thank you. No problem, no problem. Thank you for, uh, for that okay. clarity. Um, yeah. um, so uh, Thurgood Marshall here in the United States um, used the law to fight against racial injustice. We know that's the same way that Nelson Mandela uh, and, and many members of the ANC used the law to fight against racial injustice. injustice. So what role do you guys think that lawyers and, uh, and attorneys have um, as it relates to fighting against injustice, not just in the courtroom, but in kind of the greater society? And whoever wants to jump in and take it can go first. Oh, well, I'll take it. Uh, I think that uh, as attorneys, I think it's our job to identify those issues. And I think we are the impetus that gets that ball rolling because, uh, I think in the legal community, we bring these issues to the judge to deal with, because a lot of times uh, when you have, you may have a law that may be discriminatory in nature, you may have something uh, that, that is not being applied fairly. So at that point, you can bring that, whether it's, whether it's a, a, some type of a lawsuit that you file, or it may be an issue you bring up. It could be a criminal matter. And, and maybe uh, you want to make some new law on something and, and you can you can take it up uh, of course, with the judge, if the judge doesn't go your way, you can take them to the appellate court. They don't go your way, you can take it up to the Supreme Court. So I think the role of the, of the attorney uh, as an advocate uh, is, is critical because without these issues being brought uh, to judges or brought to a point where there's some law that can be either be made or, or, or removed, uh, then, then you don't have any change at that point. You know, if you look at a lot of the things that have happened, especially in, in the civil rights movement, a lot of those things involve legal uh, lawsuits like Plessy versus Ferguson or, or, or things of that nature. I mean, those are, those are things where attorneys or individuals brought those issues to the court or brought it in the forum uh, to be dealt with uh, judicially uh, to then create that change in the law and ultimately in society. My Lordship, do you have anything? Well, well, well yeah, I'm here, um, I think may, may, mainly outside of the, the courtroom is really to make people aware of their legal rights. Um, 
what is it that can be done when they are confronted with um, a matter that uh, involves um, law. Um, when I was still at university, we used to have, and I think it's still there, what they called street law. Um, yeah, street law. Uh, it involved um, high school kids acting to be um, lawyers, but guided by um, either lecturers, at, at, um, in some instances by um, lawyers uh, or attorneys, advocates, uh, guiding the process. But that's just bringing, um, during the time, during apartheid, just, um, when you are confronted with a situation, you'd, you are made aware of what you need to do. And that situation, I don't, th I, I don't think has changed a lot because um, until now, um, you have people who are not aware of their rights when com um, confronted with a situation like this. But that's the role that I think um, one can play to make people aware of the rights that they um, can exercise when um, faced with a situation that involves um, law. Thank you. I, I just want to say to uh, anyone in the ch uh, on the Zoom, if you have a question, uh, uh, please please leave it in the chat, and and my my lovely wife Adrian will make sure that is seen. And uh, so, if you have any questions, uh, please leave it in the chat. I want to jump to this here yeah, in the I'm, United I'm, States. I'm sorry, I'm Doc. Sorry. I want to clear something up before you moved on. Okay. Uh, I actually cited the wrong case. I said Plessy versus versus Ferguson. I was I uh, wanted to allude to Brown versus Board of Education. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, I, I, well, we know those are two like nominal cases in in, in, in Black American history. Uh, one is about public education, and the one is about public accommodation. So we definitely right. know that those are very important cases. But I want to ask you this: then, since since you jumped in, so we know that in the U.S., uh, a disproportionate amount of poor people are arrested, right? Uh, how do we address this imbalance? Because a lot of times they don't have the money to pay for the type of defense that others can get that will possibly not get them convicted. And I'm not sure if it's the same in essay and when we'll ask my lordship, but um, how, how, how do we address this, this imbalance? Oh, man, that, that's, a, that's, that's the, the million dollar question. I mean, um, uh, you know, you, you kind of have to balance two things, I think, when you think about or address that issue, because on one end, you have the issue of public safety, right? You have someone who's maybe been charged with a crime and, and, and they probably should have to make a bond to get out. But on the other end, you have the, the, the fact that uh, just because someone is charged with something, it's just an allegation. And, and bonds shouldn't be punitive if they can't make it. So the problem lies there because then what is the middle ground? Is the middle ground, do we say, we just don't give, we just don't, don't have bonds and, and people can just, you know, get arrested, get booked, and go home, uh, which I think is not the answer. And I also don't think the answer is giving everybody a million dollar bond, you know, um, because I think there are also certain inequities that uh, give certain people a little more of an advantage in the criminal justice system than others that I don't think is appropriate all the time. Uh, but I think the way to get around that is really to beef up the indigent defender programs. That's one avenue, because a lot of times, um, I mean, and, and I mean, I'm just be honest with you. I've been in, I've been in, in that in, in Tulane and Broad. Well, Tulane and Broad is, is the courthouse here in in Orleans Parish. But I've been in courthouses all over the state, and a lot of times, uh, public defenders uh, are sometimes in a situation where they can't always put their best foot forward for clients because they have so many. Um, and I think if there was a way to kind of counteract or, or give them maybe the resources they need to be more effective. Uh, that could be an answer. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't think the answer is necessarily, um, you know, low bonds all the way around or, or like you have this thing now with certain judges giving people $1 bonds and, and things of that issue. I don't think that's really the answer. I think the answer is uh, holding ourselves accountable 
as members of the legal community to make sure we're doing everything to advance the interests of our client. Because whether you have a public defender or not, if you have a bond that's out of proportion for what your charge is, then your lawyer should be fighting for you. You know, there should be something that should be brought to the court's attention or there be should some avenue that can be taken to remedy that. You know, one thing I think we lose sight of as advocates is at the end of the day, we are problem solvers. Mm -hmm. But we get so caught up in other things that we lose sight of that. At the end of the day, people don't wake up in the morning and say, you know, life's going good. I think I want to hire a lawyer today. No. You know, <laughs> when people come to your office, they're coming to you because they have a problem that they need yes. solved. You know, when you go see a doctor, for the most part, you're going to see a doctor because you have a problem uh, that needs to be solved. So I think once we really wrap our head around that and and, and I think hold ourselves accountable as uh, in the legal community, I think then you start to see uh, changes and you start to see people getting the treatment that I think they probably deserve. And, and, and it even goes beyond us to the bench, to the judges we put in place, uh, you know, to, to make decisions. But um, I, th I think, it, I think you know, it's accountability on, on us, on the attorneys and other members of the other system. I think we have a question for you, Brother Yusi, but I'm going to let my lordship kind of jump in and, and, and answer that question, um, the one you just answered. Um, yeah. In, in South Africa, is there a disproportionate amount of poor people in the criminal justice system? And if so, how do we uh, account for this imbalance, uh, imbalance and, and how do we make sure that they're receiving the... Uh, the type of justice that those with means also receive. Yeah, but that's a, quite a big problem, and um, different uh, means of uh, resolving that questions have been uh, employed. One of them is uh, the public defender system, which I think which we copied from which you copied from your country, but that um, cannot address. Um, the situation because the problem is larger than the public defender system. Uh, it's more about eco it's more about economics, um, and I say economics because um, for as long as uh, you don't address poverty, um, for as long as you still have the rich and the poor. Um, you will always have that um, schism. And um, you'll always have a larger um, um, population that is poor being, exactly what your question um, requires to know. But you have to change the whole system. That would be my take of it. But I don't think um, it's something that the justice system alone hmm can address. So um, fr from time to time, you'll have um, people who are poor being arrested for uh, pickpocketing, uh, theft, and so on. Um, and those will always be common in poor, in poorer um, communities, unlike the more affluent um, or affluent societies. Now, how you address that is to uplift the society as a whole. Um, if it were possible, I would say, make everyone a middle class, but uh, that's not possible. Yeah. But um, address the economics, you will have less and less people being involved in um, petty crimes. Okay, definitely. That's and my that, take. That, that, I think that is a phenomenal take. Um, um, we have a question, and I think I'm going to pose this to, to let me make sure everyone's muted. Okay. I think we're going to pose this question to, um, not oppose, pose this question to Brother uh, Yusi, uh, because it's coming from a brother from the United States. He wants to know about basically, he, he's saying, you know, the police will pull you over because, or, or stop you even if you're walking. And this is a very big problem for African Americans because you look suspicious, right? But they're saying you are not under arrest, but I'm detaining you. How much information do you have to share with the police officers? Do you have to uh, show your ID when, when asked? Um, do you even have to stand there and stay if they say you're not under arrest? Mm -hmm. So um, so that's kind of a, a, a big, a lot of issues in that question. Uh, because really uh, there's not a, there's not a, uh, an, 
just a universal answer to that because it's it's a very fact specific situation. There are certain situations where a police officer has can actually do that uh, and can patch you down, and uh, you know, and if it's for officer safety. Um, but you know, the uh, how proper that is, or, or whether it violates your constitutional rights, that's something. That's not a battle that you fight on the street. OK, that's not a battle that you fight with that police officer when it happens, because you're going to lose that and you're going to go to jail. But the way to deal with it is, unfortunately, and, and it's just sad that that that's the state we're in. It's one of those situations where it has to be dealt with in a proper venue, which is in that courtroom, in those four walls, raising those constitutional issues, raising the, uh, the fact that it, it's a bad stop or, or your rights were violated by this particular officer's actions but the way to do it is not on the street the way to do it is not at the traffic stop and, and i think that's where a lot of things happen and 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 it's just unfortunate um but there's there's no way to really stop it and get ahead of that i mean i think it comes from the training law enforcement training um you know because i think i think at this point a lot of things we see going on and a lot of things like this brother is asking about just being stopped for no reason happens because the law enforcement is, isn't really properly trained you know and i think a lot of that comes from fear you know you have you have police officers that are that that are fear the community and you have members of the community that fear the police officers so when you have fear on both sides anything can happen you know uh, sometimes the worst person to deal with in a situation like that is a person that's scared because there's no telling what they may do. And if it's a police officer, there's no telling what that officer, that officer may pull his gun. If it's a citizen, there's no telling what that citizen is. He may run, he may whatever. But that's really the root of where this brother's question comes from. You know, because when you have those bad stops and you have things like that where people, people's constitutional rights being violated, a lot of times it just comes from the fact that 90% of the time that officer is scared and doesn't know what he's doing. You know, but the way to deal with that is not to engage right then and there. The way to deal with it is unfortunately on that back end when you have someone that can raise the constitutional issues, can raise the due process issues that will ultimately benefit you in the end. Okay. And you know, I, I got a question for 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 the for for, for Judge uh, Ryan uh, in the chat, but I wanted to address what we usually was saying. Just the other day, I watched a video where two lawyers were arrested because they were actually in possession of um, their client's cell phone. I don't, I, I don't know the, the the details of it, but they were arrested. And as the brother was being arrested, he was like, you really want to arrest a lawyer? Do you know, I know my constitutional rights, but go ahead, put the cuffs on me. You right. know, take, because he understood that he didn't, out, he didn't need to get belligerent and, and fight that there. He spent an hour or two in jail and ended up winning whatever case he had against the uh, the police officers for arresting him. So uh, unfortunately, sometimes we just have to take that ride. I tell my clients, you can beat the charge, but you can't beat the ride. I'm about to take that ride. So um, right now, uh, Brother Sandeli has a question for Judge, for uh, my Lordship Brian. He says, why does legal aid, I'm gonna read it word for word because I'm not quite sure. This, this may be something very uh, uh, specific to South Africa. Why does legal okay. aid small claims court refused to issue a letter of demand in a case where a private citizen that can't afford lawyers but is owed money for a service rendered to an entity that falls under government. I'm not quite sure. I understand the-, the Yeah, but, but, um, sorry, perhaps you need to repeat. I don't understand as well. Okay, let's see. And maybe he can rewrite it or maybe we can let him come on and ask. Uh, I have but said, number one, it seems to be to be falling outside of the criminal justice system anyway. Okay. Yeah, it's more civil. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It's more civil. Um, it's outside the um the uh precinct of the criminal justice system. Okay. But but perhaps you can rephrase it one uh, so that one can understand it better. Yeah, 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 can you can you put that back in the chat maybe uh, a little more succinctly for us? Uh, this next question is for actually uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Yusi says, in a lot of situations that we see on TV where police, where the police officer attempts to arrest the suspect, oftentimes the suspect refuses to be arrested, which could lead to an undesirable outcome for the suspect. Question is, why do the suspects refuse to be arrested by the police? Assuming they agree to be arrested, would they 
not be able to call their lawyer at the police station and who would then arrange uh, bail for them? Okay. That's a lot. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm kind of, I'm kind of reading it too, so I can kind of, kind of go through it. Um, now, as far as why someone refuses to be arrested by the police, again, it kind of goes back to what I said earlier. It could be a number of reasons. It could be that that person feels like he's being uh, unfairly arrested. Uh, it could be, he could feel like he, he's being targeted or racially profiled, or he, it could be a fear. I mean, I mean, I, I think we, we, what we downplay is that, you know, people, I mean, we're, we're in a climate now where people really fear the police. And, and that's something, and I'm 43 years old, and I've seen a lot in these 43 years with police interactions, especially with my profession, but I don't think I've ever seen it to this point where, where it's, it's people literally have to have discussions with their children about how not to get shot by the police if they get pulled over. I mean, that's where we at as a society here in the United States. Now, so why does that person refuse to be arrested? It could be a number of reasons. Uh, but at the end of the day, as I said earlier, and as, as, as Dr. Asad uh, mentioned, kind of, that's why you get that phone call when you go to jail. I mean, you're just not gonna win that battle on the streets with a police officer who has the upper hand, who has the handcuffs, who has the gun, who can call for three or four other units to come to that location. I mean, that's just something you're not gonna win by yourself, even if you, even if they are wrong. You know, the way to do it is, is pretty much like uh, you alluded to earlier, Doc. I mean, with the lawyers, I mean, sometimes you just have to go ahead and take the ride, you know, and deal with it on the back end. So, um, you know, I, I think maybe the reason people don't wait to, to go to jail and make that call to the lawyer is because they want to deal with it right then and there. And, and, and maybe they think they can get the result that they want right then and there, but, but they're not. I'm going to tell you this. Once you get pulled over and that police officer has made up his mind that, that you're going to be booked or you're going to jail, there's nothing you're going to be able to say. There's nobody you're going to be able to call to change his mind. You know, and, 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 and you just have to, at that point, just trust in the, the representation you get uh, to go ahead and, and advance your interest and advocate for you and, and get the outcome that you deserve. Hey, listen, there's a meme on Facebook that says, you know, once, the, once that officer passed the back of that car and tells you, hang tight, no, you're going to jail. <laughs> when he tells you, hang tight, you about to go to jail. You know, so um, this is the question I think that for, 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 for either one of the panelists, and then this will probably be the last question because we want to make sure we respect everyone's time. And we are at now at 12.07. It says, uh, what happens when, um, when lawyers decide that they are uncomfortable defending someone? Let me see. Uh oh, I messed it up. What happened? Oh, I, someone jumped in and kind of, that's why I had my wife doing this, but uh, <laughs> all right. So what happens when a lawyer decides that they are uh, uncomfortable defending someone for whatever reason, how does that help in making justice accessible? I guess it says all lawyers actually decide that they are uncomfortable defending someone for whatever reason, how does that help making uh, make justice accessible? Who wants, judge, judge, you wanna take that one? Well, well, well um, what I can say is this, there will be a very good reason when um, an attorney or a legal representative feel uncomfortable um, to continue representing um, an offender um, or a suspect. Um, at times, it could be that he knows um, what the offender has done and he feels uncomfortable continue to represent him knowing what, um, what the offense is that he has committed. Um, you can't um, represent um, a person with, when you know that what you're defending is sexually not right. So your conscience says no, um, you can't continue. Um, Alternatively, I'm just thinking, trying to think of other reasons. Um, yeah, but ma ma mainly I think it's it's a fighting against your your, your conscience that is, that comes up um, a lot, or where you suddenly find that you are conflicted. Maybe you are representing two people. The one says, 
um, we did this. The other says, no, we didn't. How do you continue representing the one or the other? Mm. So you're forced to withdraw. Um, yeah, but um, the, the context in which it comes is that how, how, how does that make, sorry, how does that make the law accessible? Um, well, in the context of what I've just said, I, I don't think um, it does anything. It's more um, the conscience of the person who is, um, um, who is uh, representing those people. I, I, I don't know whether I'm, yeah. There's a question that came in. Uh, I, this is specifically for you. Are there instances where a judge can recuse uh, themselves from a matter or a case? From a matter? Yeah, from a from a uh, from a matter or a case. Or recuse themselves from a case. Oh, from a case. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, we are always asked to recuse ourselves because um, there is perceived conflict, or there is actual, or there could be um, actual conflict. And on each occasion, on each occasion, it's for the judge to. Um, there is law around that. When does a judge um, recuse himself? Um, you, you you have to um, fall squarely within um, the parameters of that um, test. Um, you, you don't just recuse yourself because someone wants you to be recused, or wants you to recuse yourself. So um, I'm just trying to uh, think of the, um, how the test is formulated or has been formulated, but um, I can't just um, um, recall how it is formulated, but there must be grounds on which you, 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 you think you should recuse yourself. Uh, Usually, I'll let you jump in, and then I think that will be our final question, and we'll we'll wrap up with some closing arguments since we're dealing with some legal legal people here. Some closing arguments, but uh, brother Usi, what it, has there ever been a you know yeah. uh, about rec recusal from a case? Absolutely, um, there there issues. Um, I mean, where I get an example of of, of a situation that, that actually I'm dealing with right now that I'm probably going to file a motion for recusal. I have a matter. Uh, in another parish, not in Orleans Parish, where I re represent a young man who was charged with uh, having a, a sizable amount of heroin and all kind of other drugs uh, in his possession, and, and he's being accused of being a drug dealer. Well, it just so happens that the section that the, the case has gone to, uh, that particular judge had a son that overdosed on heroin and has been very uh, vocal about his feelings on drugs and people who use drugs, people who sell drugs. So that in and of itself uh, at least gives me an opportunity to press before the court uh, the idea that maybe this judge cannot be fair to my client because of his personal uh, experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and again, you file that motion of recusal and then it goes to another set of judges to kind of determine whether or not uh, that judge uh, should be recused or not. But, but there are a number of situations that, that, that where recused can be. It can be a business interest, uh, some other personal matter, uh, could be a fact I had another case where, where the judge lived right next door to the victim in the case, you know? Mm. Uh, so, I mean, there, there are a number of reasons that, that you might want to follow, but there are situations where uh, judge judges would have to be recused for those type of situations. Definitely, man. Look, we have 18 people on this call and we thank each and every one of you for spending this little time with us on this Sunday um, to discuss the criminal justice systems, both in South Africa and in uh, the United States in particular in the state of Louisiana. I want to thank my lordship for the, for his participation, um, you know, and brother UC for his participation. You guys are just phenomenal legal minds. And I think a lot of people who are on this call, as well as a lot of people who will see the replay on YouTube, will be able to take a lot of information with them, both have a better understanding of how the systems work in, in both countries or in this, this state, because this is like a whole nother country. <laughs> and, uh, and an and essay. But now I'll give you guys your, your closing arguments uh, and we're gonna take it to Brother UC and then we'll allow our, our Lordship to close us out. Uh, well, well, thank you, Doc. Uh, well, I, I just appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak with you all this morning. 
Um, it was definitely my pleasure. Uh, if there's any uh, reason or any other questions you have for me, I'm sure Doc has my information uh, and he'll forward it to me. But uh, I've definitely had a blast and I, I look forward to hopefully doing this sometime again with you all. And I got to say, initially we were going to have uh, 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 another brother who was supposed to be on, but he had a, a, an engagement to pop up. And I called this brother at 1030 this morning so he could be on at 11 o'clock and he he jumped on. So thank you again, brother. You you saved the day, man. That's, you are a problem solver. <laughs> you solve this problem. Uh, so I appreciate it. Uh, my lordship. Yes, uh, but, uh, thank you very much for your invitation. I hope I was um, of assistance um, to some of those questions that um, uh, people had and um, that um, they will, um, or um, people can uh, appreciate the differences between um, the two um, countries. Um, I think there are more similarities than uh, differences um, between the two system. Um, and that's because we have inherited largely from you guys and from uh, the Europeans. But um, I look forward to uh, participating um, at any time when uh, I'm called upon. Um, once again, thank you very much for um, inviting me. Man, thank you so much for being here. I got to give a special thank you to Brother Ezekiel for arranging this. You know, Brother Ezekiel has been just, just, just a phenomenal person. You know, uh, you know, from taking me to the Alexandria Township and having me eat what what I, what did I eat? Uh, sheep tripe? <laughs> yeah, sheep tripe. Yeah, so I. I appreciate it. So arranging all of this, man, he sends me information all the time. So I definitely appreciate it. I am humbled that I was able to, um, cause, cause my Lordship actually did a, did some research and found an article from like 1991 that was written about you and, and, you know, the, oh. the unfortunate incident with, with, uh, um, losing your sight, uh, and the ability to, to still persevere to, to achieve such, such, high greatness uh, is, is, is really inspirational. Uh, so I, I was humbled to have you here uh, to be able to hold this conversation with you. And uh, I think, well, someone made a comment right here and I think this is important. And uh, I just wanted to say this. They said, uh, this dialogue has made them appreciate the power that cops have in the United States and the fear uh, and the fear uh, and the danger my people are facing. And, and it's very important. And that's why I think it's important that we have um, advocates uh, and attorneys and lawyers and judges like yourselves who can really understand the conditions of our people, both in SA as well as in uh, the United States, because I'm, I'm sure that there are similar concerns um, for, for African people, people of African descent all over the world. So thank you guys for being here. And uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah. That's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you have a lovely day. You too. You have a great one, Your Honor.